the name of the game is for climate policy traditionally um, how do you mot motivate more people to do more how do you motivate more people to mitigate more to cut co2 emissions yep. Yep. Um, yep. for solar geoengineering the question in many ways is how do you stop people from doing too much too soon stupidly you know, we have to cut CO2 emissions and yeah, we need to suck CO2 out of thin air. And you know, that sounds expensive energetically and monetarily. Um, so the question is, how do you scale that up? How do you climb the learning curve, slide down the cost curve, scale mm -hmm. up the technology, make it less expensive? For solar geoengineering, in many ways, you know, what we know, what we think we know about the topic, the technology, stratospheric aerosols, these sorts of things, is that it is so powerful, so potentially powerful, so cheap, relatively speaking, that, you know, in right. the extreme, it's the free driver effect sort of, it's so cheap that it might as well be free, right? The costs, right. the direct costs of doing it, potentially, mm -hmm. basically don't matter. The risks, the uncertainties, they matter a lot, but it's different from the direct costs to those attempting to solar geoengineer the planet. For solar geoengineering, you know, I guess the, the, the harsh way of putting it is there's basically no role for the private sector. I mean, you know, at some point, right, like, you know, maybe, of course, but, you know, sure, this is not a... This is not a technology that, you know, back to this free driver effect that is in any way, shape or form costly enough to warrant us worrying about driving down the costs. These individual questions are, um, uh, most directly or or only really apply to those who have the choice in the first place right like you know just to be clear right this is um uh, not a question for frankly lots of people who sadly don't have the choice were in some sense it is society it is policy that guides or for the matter locks us into inferior choices we are as a society and have been right in the u.s for decades essentially right there is you know we're even getting the language wrong so every right. home under 1400 square feet right is called a starter home it's right. the sort of thing that right the real estate agent sells you or encourages you to buy um and basically you know is is gleeful about you buying the small house because she knows you will be back in five years because you need a True. bigger home right um right. and that's sort of what you do right that's just the life you know that's that's the norm we are not pricing climate risk climate right. damages properly right because if we did yeah more square feet would cost a lot more and Absolutely. we would you know be encouraged to you know, live more efficiently. You know, now we are back to market forces, right? Um, where essentially at what point is more is sort of the, you know, channeling or the desire to have more, in fact, um, inappropriately, um, you know, inappropriately much, right? Like basically at what point is um, sort of uh, does maximizing your square feet or wanting more square feet actually butt heads against all these other priorities where we yeah. are no longer optimizing our lives, but we are simply maximizing square feet because, you know, society tells us that's what you should be doing. Frankly, the pithy five word answer is it's too late for pessimism. We are still losing the race against unmitigated climate change but yeah this is now frankly the race between positive socio-economic tipping points on the one hand versus negative climatic tipping points and you know yeah too late for pessimism right.